Hello to all our audiences and a happy Mother's Day. Uh, my name is Jill Caldicott. I'm director of the British Council here in Sri Lanka. And today I'm going to be in conversation with recently published writer, Tanya Waranakulasuria, a surname that I admittedly struggled to pronounce. British, but of Sri Lankan origin, and now living in Sri Lanka for the past eight years, I believe, Tanya has a background in media, and in the arts, having worked both for the BBC and for the British Council. And more recently, she's branched out on her own as an independent creative and has been commissioned as a scriptwriter, has published poetry, written a collection of short stories, which we're going to dis discuss today, and, and has even ventured into music production. So I would like to welcome Tanya. Hi there, Jill. Hi, Tanya. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lovely to be here. I have quite a few questions for you, and I'm going to ask you to read from Mum's The Word. Uh, just to start us off, though, I want to know why the pseudonym? Why is Mum's The Word apparently written by someone called P.T. Tovener? And is there any significance in the name? Um, well, the... the I love the idea of having a nom de plume. I think uh, in this day and age, you know, where identity is, is so aligned to everything we do and, um, you know, with identity theft and things where we, we have to be ourselves a lot of the time. This is, you know, one of the areas where we can legitimately um, write and create under another name. And I, I think that's great fun. And, and I've always thought that if ever, ever I wrote um, a, a book and, you know, I have written uh, sort of other manuscripts at the moment, um, I will use uh, nom de plumes. I, I love them. I think they're great fun. And it's sort of an adult way of, of being, I don't know, playing pretend a little bit and being a different character. So why not? Why not do it? Um, and in terms of the name, uh, Tovenar is, it's actually a Dutch, it's the Dutch word for witch, for sorceress. Um, <laughs> and I love witches. I've always loved witches. Um, you know, my favourite book when I was in junior school was The Worst Witch. Um, I love anything to do sort of magical stuff. When I was going through my turbulent teenage years and my gothic things, I was very into sort of the paganism and witchcraft and all of that stuff. Um, and you know, even my nephews nowadays, they I'm I'm Auntie Tan and I am the witch. So I think I recently remember when um, we did at the British Council the Harry Potter celebration of the Harry Potter books, and I was reading, and I was Professor McGonagall, um, and there was a picture of me in the uh, in the costume, which was great fun, and I showed my nephew, and he he said, "Of course they picked you, Auntie Tan, because you're a witch." You know, it's that I am I'm a witch so so that's where the name comes from. <laughs> well let's hope you're a good witch. <laughs> depends, depends on what mood, a grey witch, let's, let's, let's put it that way. Okay, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong but I believe Mum's the Word is your first published book and okay. it was in the UK in 2019 about uh, eight months or so ago. Yes. Um, uh, could you first please tell us a bit about what other writing you've done and uh, was there a build up to this? Um, so the other writing, I mean, when I, when I started uh, looking at writing the book, I'd, I'd always wondered for years whether I, whether I could do it. Um, and I wanted to see if, you know, if I had it in me to be, to be a published writer. Um, I have a best friend who is a, a, a publisher and she always used to say to me, no, you don't want to be a, you don't want to be a writer. You just want, you like the idea of having your name on the spine of a book, which she said is what, what most people, you know, when they aspire to be a writer, that's what they, they're really looking for. Um, and we do have friends who are writers and it's, it is very sort of isolated and dark and you're sort of on your own a lot and um, you know I didn't know whether I'd be able to do that I've actually found that I, I do actually enjoy that quite a bit um, and um, when I started I didn't really I mean I'd already started writing things when I came to Sri Lanka I had a, I found I had a lot more free time and I was just making observations of um, things that were going on around me and I would just start writing just creative little sort of essays and things 
um, not really intending to do anything with them. But the more I wrote, the more people would, I'd read them out and people would say, you know, what are you going to do with these? So I did then look to get that first collection published. It was actually quite quite a feminist book really. I mean, it had lots of sort of women's stories that were sort of, I was, I was being privy to. Um, and that actually got rejected. Um, it was apparently too disparate. The, some of the stories were funny, some of the stories were dark. There, were, there was a whole sort of gamut of things in there. Um, and publishers don't really tell you because they have so many unsolicited um, uh, works to, to go through, they, they just reject. Um, but I, I had a very sweet uh, uh, editing assistant and I think she sort of mentioned that it was a very disparate set of stories and um, maybe I should look at taking one. So some of them were very dark and some of them were humorous and maybe I should look at taking one of those and sort of extrapolating it or trying to work on something that was a bit more consistent. So that's how mum came about. But in the meantime, because all of this was totally new and I really didn't know what I was doing, um, I decided to look at sort of other, I mean, nowadays the genres of writing, creative writing that are out there, there's so many. So I started looking at, into some of those and, you know, writing, each one sort of has different skill sets. So even amongst the short stories, you've got, you know, I write sort of steampunk and deco punk, which is uh, teenage stories, which have a sort of um, gritty teenage uh, characters, um, who are in sort of new information age, science fiction, fantasy type things. I write sort of occult detective stories. Um, I do a lot of writing for literary magazines and that was a really good way to practice different styles of writing. Um, writing for the internet is entirely, you know, you sometimes you have to write a whole story in 300 words, which is just, you know, it's mind blowing because the, the descriptions, mm -hmm. you know, you have to do all the, the length of sentences entirely different. So very different skill sets in each of those in each of those genres, um, and I just played around with all of them and just submitted loads of loads of stuff, and that's really that's really how I started. And how long was that going on for before you actually got published? Would you say? More well, I, um, I probably about a, a year of doing that off and on while I was still working. I was just submitting things and playing around and seeing. Um, seeing where they would go and not really paying too much mind for it. And then when um, I submitted a few chapters of Mum, because I hadn't done the full book, so I, you know, I just submitted it and um, they said they were interested and then um, to make a start on the manuscript. And that's when I, you know, I, I resigned from work and decided I was going to give it a go and do it for a year <laughs> and see how, how that worked. So, so yeah. that was it. Yeah, well, it's quite a big jump, isn't it, to leave a paid job and to branch out on your own. So what yes. did that feel like and how did you adapt? It felt awful. It felt, it felt sort of quite um, exciting initially once you've sort of made the decision and you've handed everything in. And then you, it's like buyer's remorse on buying a house. You then go through this thing of, oh, my God, what have I done? Um, and then I just assumed that, you know, I would work the way I work um in the office so i assumed that i would get up at nine you know i'd get up i'd sit at my desk at nine i'd finish at five and i'd just bash out some pages and it didn't work like that at all and for the first three months i mean literally from january to march i nothing was coming out and i was really panicking because i had to get this you know the first draft of this manuscript into them and nothing just i just couldn't get anything out. and um i remember my partner tony saying look you know, just just relax and it'll come and there's sort of this, and everyone talks about, you know, this creative, so the inspiration will come. And so you really sort of have to find your creative process. And that was a bit of a journey that, you know, I hadn't realized I had to go on, but I, I did go on that journey. I, I, I've now got a, a, a prescribed way of, of how I write. I write longhand in a notebook um, first. And that forces me to think and that forces me to sort of really sort of navel gaze and I'm not very good. I wasn't very, I found I wasn't very good at just sitting and thinking and doing nothing. I found that like, you know, I've been brought up to think that's a bit of a waste of time, just sort of navel gaze thing. Um, so, but you have to do that in, in the creative process. You have to sit and just let your mind run free. Um, and so I, I sort of cultivated that and, and learned how to do that. And then, and then when it sort of started, you know, I'd be getting up at 
two in the morning with an idea and then just writing all the way through for like two, three days. I'd write without eating. I would, I'd just sit there and Tony would say, you know, you need to get, you need to get out of the house because you need some airing because you just sat in one position for so long. It's not good. Um, but that's kind of how it, how it works. It's quite exciting when it happens. It, it just kind of grabs you the inspiration and you just have to go with it. Okay, well, let's take a closer look at Mum's The Word. Um, in the dedication, you make it quite clear that the book is dedicated to your mother. And so the reader then begins to suppose that it is indeed your mother that you're writing about. And this, in fact, is largely autobiographical. And in fact, at the end of the book, you say something about your mother's reaction to it. So how did you tread that fine line between fact and fiction? Or is indeed, is it mostly fact uh, through a daughter's eyes? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's definitely fiction. Although I suppose if you ask my mother, she'd say, no, it's absolutely her. Cause she loves the fact that, you know, she's, she's, she's <laughs> this book's, I hate this book. It's terrible. It's washing all our dirty linen. And then she promptly phones everybody up and tells them to, you know, get the book. And that she's, and you know, my daughter's written a book about me and she hasn't written it under her name. So you have to go and find it. Um, but it's, it's, Sort of the foundations of it are sort of her character, but there are extrapolations. I think Kalyani is a is a sort of a more of a caricatured character. Um, Tara is, um, I think the sort of the sentiments in the relationships between the two are quite similar. But um, Tara's, you know, her certain things that have happened for her when it had not happened for me. So it's a sort of a mishmash. Um, I've taken some stories where the, the, the start of the story is something that maybe has happened in our lives and then just extrapolated it and take, taken it further than, than what actually happened. So it's not, it's not directly based on her, but there are little sort of, there are elements of her. Okay. I should say, of course, at the outset, that it's very affectionate as well as humorous. Um, despite some of the frustrations that all daughters feel, and that clearly comes through. <laughs> So um, for me, the introduction sets the scene beautifully. And if I, can, if I can quote, everybody has a story to tell about their mum, don't they? She's that inimitable creature that reigns supreme over us, molding, shaping and influencing our lives during our most formative years. And when I read that, I recognised it immediately. And I think everybody will, particularly, particularly women, particularly yes. girls. Um, Tanya, I think you've chosen an extract to read for us. Yes. Um, so I've chosen actually the very start of the book, um, just because people really sort of like this. And this is actually sort of based on how my parents met. Um, so I will read a little bit of this. This is called The Apple. The SS Canberra was an 820 foot P&O ocean liner, well known for its beauty, its appearance in the James Bond movie, Diamonds Are Forever, and for its service to its country during the Falklands War. Operating the Southampton to Sydney route from the early 60s, it was also the vessel that would bring new opportunities and new lives to emigrating travelers, including my father, who was bound for England as a young engineer. The Canberra was the chariot to my father's future in more ways than he knew. Not only would this two week long journey take him to new lands and new occupations, it also was the place where he would meet and fall in love with my mother. My father's account of how he met my mother reads like a silver screen romance. On the open deck of the ship, this young man catches sight of an attractive young woman in a figure hugging green Shong Sam dress. Audrey Hepburn style sunglasses, billowing headscarf and kitten heels. The veritable ode to 50s fashion, as she minced along the deck doing her very best Marilyn Monroe wiggle, partly for show and partly because her stride was so restricted by the narrow hem of her dress, the heel of her shoe got caught in the grooves of the deck and she toppled forward. My father said she crashed to the floor, bolt upright as though she were a felled tree her face and body hitting the deck simultaneously in one straight line. He'd never seen anything like it. When he recovered from the shock, he hurried over to help the poor girl up to her feet. And as he did so, 
he saw the perfectly formed bright red Cupid bow imprint of her lipstick on the wooden deck. She literally kissed the deck with all her might. Concerned that she might have sustained some nasty injuries as a result of such a fall, my father stepped in to see if she had cut her lip or her face. As he leaned in, he received a stinging slap for his troubles. My mother, having been primed, warned, and completely brainwashed to the point of abject terror about the devious and conniving ways of all young men, instantly assumed my father was taking advantage of her accident to steal a kiss. That slap led to a romance, which led to a 44-year marriage and two children. The green Shangsan dress was kept by my father as a loving memento of that meeting until the day he died. That's wonderful. And it's absolutely a memorable image. And I, I will keep that image in my mind for a long time. It's wonderful. Thank you. I like all the stories, actually. But um, there was one that particularly struck me, and it's the one that is called The Argument for Staying Single. Mm. So I think I liked it because, of course, um, it has that singular Sri Lankan flavour to it. Uh, but I also reckon that all young girls growing up in London that era felt the same sort of subtle pressure somehow of not having quite made it if they weren't married, however successful their careers were. And I guess that still happens here in Colombo, even nowadays. So there's a sort of universality about it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right, Jill. I think, you know, I mean, if you look at the, the dating, the internet dating scene and the dating scene, you know, it's big business. And why is that? It's because I think um, we are still fundamentally um, sort of, we have that deep uh, desire to sort of, you know, grow up and you get the career and you get married. Um, and even now, you know, not just in the 80s, but you know, I talk to, to young girls and sort of nieces and um, young girls that I know and that, that sort of want to get married and that want to sort of have the white dress and, and the, you know, the, 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 the kind of the day um, is still there. It's deeply entrenched. And I think that for me says something about culture. Culture is something that, you know, it is in our veins. And as much as we can be modern women, as, as much as we can be, you know, have careers and all of those things, um, some of these some of these very traditional rituals and, and rites are still very, very deeply ingrained for us. Yes, and there's um, one point in the story, uh, well, there's a couple of points, but one of them, um, there's one point where there's a desperate attempt to find Tara, who's now in her mid-twenties, a husband. And there are yeah. some really, really funny scenes where an astrologer is consulted, and another where an advert is placed in a Sri Lankan paper and an argument ensues over caste. Those to me seem really, really rooted in Sri Lankan culture. And I guess they must have been very alien to a girl brought up in London. Well, it's funny. I mean, they are. They're, they're you know, because I, I say in the book that when you are that first generation of an immigrant, um, of immigrant parents, you are treading this fine line between two cultures because you're born in a new country and you're brought up British. Um, and um, yet there is this, this pull from your parents to remind you or to really to remind them of the roots where they came from. And you see that, you definitely see that with, you know, in Sri Lanka. So, you know, the, 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 the families that first came from Sri Lanka to, to Britain, um, uh, would get to know each other and, and, and uh, trying to maintain those traditions and, and the dances and the, you know, me, get, making sure your kids met each other, that sort of thing. And I, as I say in the book, you know, it's like, the thing is you've grown up with these guys since the age of five. So it's kind of like dating your brother. It's just, not, <laughs> you don't see them in that way. Um, but I, I do think since living out here in, in, in Sri Lanka, I see it the other way as well. You know, I do have expat friends who maintain a lot of uh, their traditions. So, for example, you know, I have Scottish friends. The Caledonian Ball is one of the oldest Caledonian balls in Colombo. Is, is one of the oldest ones in the world, actually. And I think the BBC did a, did a program on it once. It's one of the things that, you know, and I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a chieftain, here 
his daughter saying, you know, back in Scotland, we probably wouldn't, we wouldn't do half of these things. We just, you know, we wouldn't do the Burns Night and we wouldn't, we wouldn't really celebrate them as much as we do here. But that need to kind of maintain your identity mm. and your tradition and let your mm. children remember those. My, my brother lives in the States and I have two nephews, you know, five and seven. And suddenly he's become very, not just his British roots, which he's really sort of inculcating in them, so they know all about Britain, but a little bit of Sri Lankan roots, which, you know, he doesn't really know them because I don't know them when we were born up in Britain. So, so that kind of getting, getting to know that, that you're more than just, just the place you live, there is a whole tradition that comes behind you, a whole ancestry behind you. Um, yes. Yeah, I think, I think it's there. And there's, a very, there's another um, really amusing line, which is about how, um, how, how uh, parents, Sri Lankan parents in the UK will spend a lot of energy and money on their children's living and being educated in the West, but only to spend even more energy and money preventing them from living a Western life, such as yeah. using help or going out with boys, for example. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's this sort of contradiction in, in, in those things, you know, and it's very interesting because when I, when I speak to, for example, my mum about that, um, my brother and I often sort of, you know, we, we, we tease her about it because of course, you know, being, being the girl, I was definitely, my father was very open about it. He'd say, you know, I'm a chauvinist pig. You're treated one way. Your brother's going to be treated another way. And that's the way it is. You know, girls get pregnant you're going to be treated, uh, you're going to be cosseted a lot more than, than he is. Um, and it was, it was just the way things were. And when we sort of talked to mum about it now, she sort of says, yeah, I know, we were really, really tough on, <laughs> really tough on time. She wasn't allowed to do anything um, all the way through because they were so, I think it's that fearful, I, I wonder if that's still the case now, but that sort of fearfulness of, mm. of getting too yeah. westernized or getting too, you know, um, uh, you know, too sort of indoctrinated with, with this mm. different culture. Um, but then I was thinking about this uh, um, the other day that, you know, even when I was um, at, at the B, uh, there are a lot of Australians, the culture of young Australians traveling and backpacking. A lot came to the, to the UK and at one point, you know, in London, if you ever went to a pub or a bar, it was always an Aussie, a young Aussie that would be serving you behind the bar because they were all working there. Um, and I remember uh, a couple of old uh, Australian cameramen who were over for, I think, Anzac Day and Australia Day, <laughs> going to an Australian bar where these young kids were kind of, you know, letting their hair down and really kind of letting loose. And one of them saying to me, I'm so ashamed to be Australian. I would never, <laughs> outrageous the way they're acting because you know they're away and so they're just they're just kicking their heels and they're getting it all out of their system before they come back and they you know get back into the traditional way of living so you know i guess it's it's i think it's more pronounced in asian cultures definitely um but i think it's there sort of it, it, it's sort of there very subtly in other other traditions too well, whatever, whatever constraints you were under, you seem to be very successful. But uh, I was going to comment on the name of um, the daughter, the name of Tara that you chose for the daughter. And I'm sort of guessing here, but you can tell me uh, that maybe she's named after the goddess Tara, the Sri Lankan goddess, who, as I understand it, represents success in work and achievement. Is that you? Well, I don't think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's me by any stretch. I am definitely not success in work and achievement. Um, uh, uh, I'm more a, sort of a jack of all trades, master of none, a bit of, a bit of this, a bit of that. But um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's very, very interesting that you picked up on that. See, I have, I'm a huge fan of Tara um, as the, the goddess of compassion. And um, she, she is, a, in fact, one of the, one of the, the most beautiful Tara um, statues was uh, discovered in Sri Lanka um, during the medieval, it's sort of medieval statue and it shows the two strains of Buddhism, Mayana Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism. Theravada is what, what we have, um, but at some point it was also Mayana and she is a, she's a female Buddha. Um, and there's some lovely stories about her. Um, for example, one of, the, one of the legends is that she was a princess who 
um, would look after the monks um, that, were, that were sort of in her kingdom. And as, as thank you for that, when they were giving their blessings, they said to her, you know, when you attain enlightenment, we would like you to, you know, we'll ask for you to be a man in your next birth. And she said no, and she's always decided that she will always be reborn as a woman. And I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always thought, you know, if, I, if I'm reborn, I'm always going to be reborn as a woman. I'm never going to be reborn as a man because I think that's, <laughs> that's great. Definitely, she's, she definitely epitomizes the strength of women, you know, the sensuality of women, all the, all the strengths that we have. Um, and that's why I like her. And she does feature pretty much, she does a little cameo role in some way in all the manuscripts that I've written. She's there in some way, shape or form. Really? Um, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. And I, do, she, I have statues of her in the house. She's on my screensaver at my computer and on my phone. So I'm, I'm a big Tara fan, yes. Uh, of course, there's a very beautiful statue of Tara in the British Museum. Yes, there is. It's actually one of their um, top 10 antiquities. And mm -hmm. in fact, at one during the Victorian times, uh, she, was, she was kept away because she was far too erotic to be shown in public, <laughs> um, which I think is fabulous because that's just her. She's just, you know, she pushes all the boundaries all the time. She's great. Okay, thank you. It'd be really lovely if you could read us another um, section from, this, from, the, from the book. Certainly. So I thought um, you mentioned uh, the bits about um, the, the, the staying single. So I thought I would, I would pick that one up for you. The argument for staying single. Sri Lankan parents are beings of contradiction. They expend vast amounts of energy and income to give their children lives and educations in the West, and then spend even more energy forbidding their children to live a Western life. Parents remove their offspring from Sri Lanka so that they are unfamiliar with its customs and cultures and people, and then insist that they adopt those cultures and live like those people, even though such attitudes are completely alien to them. As I approached my mid to late twenties and appeared to have no male suitors around, my parents began to get concerned, parting me off to Sri Lankan dancers in the hope of me meeting a suitable boy that had, had borne little fruit. The fact that the same families had attended the same dances ever since their children were in primary school meant that all of the children had known each other since they were five dating any boys there would be like dating your brother. Your parents would also be at these dances, watching your every move and making note of any boys that glanced in your general direction. It made you feel like a prize cow being paraded in a cattle market. As more and more girls started to pair off and get hitched, my mother became more frustrated. It was clear that she was gonna to have to take matters into her own hands. There, she announced triumphantly one day as she sat back, put her pen down and held up a piece of paper. How does this sound? Columba parents living in UK seek for their UK born, five foot one, pretty, fair, slim, business graduate daughter who is well employed, a suitable partner, devoid of all vices or malefic horoscope, diary available, write with copy of horoscope, telephone number and full particulars. My father lowered his paper. What dowry? We don't have a dowry to give, unless they want the roof over our heads. Everyone offers a dowry, my mother snapped. She won't get any proposals if we don't offer one. The English is terrible, mum, I reprimanded. My mother, having won prizes at school for her English and having spent many years working for Her Majesty's Civil Service, prided herself in her command of the language. I know, she admitted. But they're all worded like this, and also the cost per word is so expensive. I have to keep it brief. Only the important information can go in. How to make a girl feel special, I thought. It's bad enough that my whole self has to be reduced to a half-inch box of seven lines consisting of adjectives like pretty, slim, fair, and educated, and that I'm, being to, I'm to be advertised in a classified column of a newspaper like an old Nissan. But just to add insult to injury, my parents have to offer to pay my future husband to take me off their hands. Why do I need to get married anyway, I moan. Do I, I do a good job. I earn a good wage. I'm completely self-sufficient, aren't I? I'm just happy as I am. It's time, 
my mother declared. You aren't getting any younger. Most girls are married and having their first child by your age. Don't you want a family of your own? A lovely husband? Some beautiful grandchildren? My mother's eyes glazed over as she clasped her hands to her bosom wistfully. Not really, I muttered. They wouldn't be my grandchildren. They'd be yours. It's our culture, our tradition rumbled my father from behind his newspaper. I don't want to bring up a daughter of mine as one of those fast women wearing sunglasses and lipstick and driving convertible sports cars with a scarf billowing in the wind. Where did he get these ideas from? Clearly my father still thought fast women dressed like Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. And it was obvious that dear dad was rather attracted to such women. And it was also obvious that his attraction alarmed him. He also seemed to have conveniently forgotten the sexy young thing in the tight green dress and the very same Audrey H. sunglasses whom he met on a ship and subsequently married. Where was the culture and tradition then? Um, I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop it there. Well, it's wonderful, but perhaps we'll pick up another extract a bit later. It's very, very, lo it's lovely, it's so funny. And I can see exactly how that would play out in a, in a, in a household, a Schlanken household, living in London, absolutely. Um, there, are other, there are lots of stories in there. Uh, there's another one that I really loved, and that was, um, there are two of them, uh, which I guess is a reference to, uh, well, uh, your mum, a mum, and her yes. sister, who yes. you call Auntie Prem in the book. And it tells the story of how the two of them came to the UK to train up as nurses in the NHS, as did many from other countries at the time. Yeah. And I was particularly struck by this and uh, your acknowledgement at the beginning of the book in which you thank NHS nurses, past, present, future, you say, and uh, you make a point that we don't sing their praises enough. And interestingly, uh, clearly you wrote this before the present pandemic in which the world has now given so much more recognition to NHS and all healthcare yeah. worldwide for their sacrifices for all of us. Um, but I'm just interested in it and what made you put, it, put in that special thanks at that time? And was there anything behind that? Um, I think I've always, I've always loved well, the nursing tradition, it features very, very heavily in my family on both sides, actually. In fact, and in fact, I very sadly lost an aunt who was a nurse. She was a retired nurse to the COVID-19 virus um, uh, a few weeks back. Um, oh, and she, she uh, yeah, she was retired, but she was still doing surgeries and she still went back and she was doing surgery. She was an amazing nurse um, and loved the job. And I think for me, First of all, um, nursing is something that uh, in, in Britain, you know, it's, it, it was one of the first professions for a woman where she could actually be recognized as a working woman. Um, you know, and you had women blazing trails like Florence Nightingale, you know, who I've been told, you know, was the, the developer of the pie chart that we all use now. Yeah. And, and she was an amazing nursing manager. She, she put the structure in nursing and, you know, nursing today still, British nurses and the British nursing um, qualifications are the best in the world. Um, so there's that. And, and, and also, you know, I, as well as Florence Nightingale in the Victorian times, there's Anna Seacole, there's another one of my heroes who is a black nurse um, who was awarded the Victoria Cross and who um, looked after nurses, uh, looked after soldiers during the Crimea. Um, so she was allowed to, to blaze a trail as a nurse. Um, and for me, it's the only uh, profession which really still to this day, I think, truly recognizes emotional intelligence and, and the strengths of women as, as nurturers and as, as people who understand vulnerabilities and, and people who see you know, it, it, as much as the, uh, the profession has structure and foundations and principles and techniques and activity, it values and recognizes the need for empathy. It values and recognizes compassion. It, it values and recognizes all of those kind of emotional soft skills, which I don't think are soft at all, because at the end of the day, in a service industry, <laughs> you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with, you know, human beings in, in various states of vulnerability. And, and 
and nursing does show that and it does it celebrates that and i think it's a great um i think it's a great profession and it's 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 you know uh, definitely needs to be recognized um so yes so it does hold a very special place for me well, it's a very timely recognition i think and of course there are many Sri Lankan nurses in the uk working in the nhs yes and i mean i think that also that during that time, this is something we don't really sort of register now, but during the Windrush times and during those times when Britain was booming and it needed um, manpower and labor and resources and it reached out to countries like Sri Lanka and, you know, when my mum joined uh, nursing, she said it was like the United Nations. She had, she had friends from all over the world who had sort of come, had been invited to come and, and work. And... Um, and we don't see that now, you know, no, sort of immigration is seen as something very hostile and very negative and very sort of borders mm. are closed. And it's this sort of welcoming of one country to another to help and, and to give new lives and to, and to, you know, there's a need for people. Um, it's something that, you know, I don't know if we'll ever, ever see that again. That, that's a time that's, that's, that's kind of gone. Yeah, sadly, I think you may be right there. Um, but we'll see as, 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 as societies open up again and see what happens. Yeah. Um, in the same story, um, we get this very affectionate portrait of Auntie Prem. Yeah. And I noticed that in the foreword, you talk about your own Auntie Sherry yes. and say you wish everyone had one. So yeah. Auntie Prem and Auntie Sherry, one and the same? They, again, they're very similar, yes. Um, Auntie Sherry uh, is, you know, she is one of my, my heroines. She, she is um, the, the, the wilder child. I think she, she's sort of a juxtaposition to my mum. My mum was the more sort of stable, conservative one, um, and Auntie Sherry was the adventurer. And apparently when they did leave for England, it was Auntie Sherry who was sort of wanted to go, and my mum was just sort of trailing along. Um, she is the one that always um, bucked the trend and, and bucked conformity and she's always done things because she wants to do them and she doesn't really care what other people think and, and for me growing up and a whole host of you know there's a lot of uh, girls in, in my family on that side we all thought she was you know she was just the bee's knees um, and she was a great aunt. She was, you know, she's, she's cool. She was always someone, and I've always said this to my nieces and nephews that, you know, if there's things that they can't tell their parents, they can always come and tell me because there's nothing they can tell me that's going to shock me or scare me or worry me. Um, they should always feel that there's someone that they can come to that's older that can help them. Um, and she, you know, she's the one who, who would say that to me and, I, um, she was just great as a, this cool aunt. She sort of epitomizes, you know, I don't have kids of my own and it's a very conscious choice not to have kids because I think being a mum is, is an incredibly brave thing to do. I think, I think you, you know, you have to be quite special to be, mom, uh, to be a mum. And aunties are sort of, like for me, I, I get the pleasure of kids um, and I thoroughly enjoy children. I, I love, I love talking to just the different perspectives that I get from, you know, even kids now who are in their twenties and I'll go and have lunch with them and they, the, the, the take on life is so different and it's fascinating to, to mm. listen to. Um, but I don't have the, I don't have the difficulties of disciplining and, you know, I, I tend to get the best side of the kids rather than, <laughs> rather than the monster sides, which, which parents mm. do. So, well, um, aunt, aunties it, seem to play a very important role in Sri Lankan society. Absolutely, yeah. They, they, um, they, they. I think, you know, with Sri Lankan society, with sort of Asian societies, that collective, that sort of the mindset of thinking of the collective is something that that Asians are the big, the bigger family, and you don't just think about you and yourself and your needs. You think about mm. your impact on the family. Um, you know, if, if you listen to young people here and they'll talk about, you know, the job aspirations, they'll always say things like, you know, I have a mother to look after, I have, you know, the, the family, I need to pay for, you know, so it's not just you, whereas when I was growing up, my wage was my wage. I just have to think of me. I might have had to, you know, put some money towards the phone bill or something that I'd, that I'd run up. But, um, you know, my money was my money. And um, mm. so that very sort of, sort of self-centered sort of individual 
the frame of thinking um, which we have in the West is is very different here. So yeah, aunties do absolutely play a, a big role in, uh, in <laughs> society here. Okay. Well, um, Tanya, I know you've chosen uh, one more extract for us to listen to. Uh, what have you chosen? Well, you mentioned the astrologer. Um, uh -huh. yeah. And so I, I thought I'd, I'd do that one. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay. So this is where um, Kalyani uh, sort of continues her, her adventure or her, her sort of her activities of trying to get Tara married off and she's clearly, you know, there's obviously something wrong with this girl, so she needs to sort of get confirmation. And in Sri Lanka, you know, we all have our horoscopes done. We, we, um, I always, I love this horse. I love horoscopes. They're so fascinating. My grandmother used to be able to read mine and mine is sort of in, in Pali or Sanskrit. It's one of the old sort of languages. And, you know, it even says things like the width of your blood vessels and, and, goes down to the sort of your physiology and your body and it's fascinating the amount of information that's sort of in there um and so uh, in the book uh, kalyani takes her horoscope Tara's horoscope to to this gentle this astrologer and this is in england um as we sit in the dingy corridor of mr abe singh's office in cricklewood my mother patted down the wrinkles in my shirt and picked off some loose threads on my shoulder I don't know why you couldn't wear the dress I bought you, she muttered, just like your father, always scruffy. Mr. Abbe Singer was an accountant cum astrologer, although judging by the clientele in his waiting room, I imagined he was more astrologer cum accountant. The room was filled with young Sri Lankan men and women like myself, all press ganged into marriage by mothers who sat next to them. It was obvious that these mothers, ever resourceful and used to making the best out of every single situation, were taking advantage of this waiting time to scout out potential suitors and to present their own offspring in the best possible light. My mother had started investigations on the woman next to her. Is this your son? He's very handsome. What does he do? Oh, a doctor! She leaned across the poor woman to pat the knee of the young man. You have made your mama very proud. Have you met my daughter? This is Tara. She works for a big multinational company. She's a manager, you know. She travels all over the world with her job. They send her to the US and Switzerland all the time. It's very stressful and she works so hard. Sometimes I don't see her the whole weekend and sometimes she stopped mid-sentence suddenly realizing that she was being a little too truthful for her own good. What mother would give up her son to an independent, successful, high-flying career woman? Actually, even though she's doing so well at work, just the other day she said to me, Mom, all I want in life is to find a loving husband to take care of me and to start a family with, didn't you, Tara? Someone from the caring profession, she said, like a surgeon or a doctor. She smiled and nodded coquettishly to the boy and his mother. Yes, I thought, not a nurse or a pharmacist or an orderly, not one of those lowly caring professionals. Only doctors and upwards need apply here. Just then, the door opened and we were invited into the inner sanctum of the astrologer's lair. At a large desk sat a diminutive, round little man with a pudgy face and not much hair. With the greatest of reverence, my mother retrieved the ancient scraps of my horoscope from the bag and handed them to him. After several minutes of poring over the symbols and jotting down numbers and coordinates and flicking through dusty almanacs and reference tables, he looked up at my mother, his baby eyes violently magnified through the ridiculously thick lenses of his glasses so that he looked like a frightened cartoon rabbit. Is this hers? He asked. And when my mother nodded, he continued, mm, she is entering into the auspicious time to marry. But he looked at his scribbles. It will not be easy to find her a husband. She is, uh, how do you say, stubborn, strong-willed. My mother nodded vigorously, as though this was the confirmation she'd been waiting for all her life. She shot me a smug look. Yes, 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 yes. Under this planetary alignment, it would have been better for her to have been born a man. 
She needs a husband strong enough to handle her. Otherwise, this marriage will end in disaster or worse, divorce. My mother was horrified at such portents. But Mr. Abhay Singh wasn't stopping there. He was only just getting started. And also, a bit more double checking and calculating ensued before he looked up, eyebrows arched in surprise on a face that was already too surprised. She has a voracious sexual appetite. You see here in this quadrant? This tells me that she's a raksha devil. She is prone to angry outbursts and is fearless in a fight. She will not back down. She will fight to the death. And this coupled with her uncontrollable sexual passions will make her a very difficult wife. These are not good qualities for a woman to have. My mother turned to look at me, the oversexed she-devil who she had been given as a daughter with tear-filled eyes. Just like her father, she whispered. <laughs> All hopes for the doctor's son-in-law fell to the floor with her tears. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I, as, as, as we all realise, this weekend has been both um, International Mother's Day and Besak, a significant Buddhist yes. holy day. And um, in the last chapter in the book, which is called um, Meditation, Mindfulness and Death, there is a strong sense of the importance of belief and um, Buddhist practices such as meditation, which the mum portrayed in this book practices. And she even goes on retreats with prolonged silences, which um, everyone finds hard to believe. Nevertheless, somehow it seems to me very appropriate somehow that we've had this conversation on this weekend. Yes, um, absolutely. And I think um, you're right. I think that the, the mothers and um, the, the, the philosophy of Buddhism, so you have the religion of Buddhism and the rituals. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, with Kalyani's character, I think it, it alludes to something where um, the Kalyani is, is brought up to be a very sort of traditional good Sri Lankan woman, you know, so there are customs and there are religions and there are things but she's also incredibly bright and intelligent. So, so, so trying to conform to customs where, you know, you conform because that's, what's, that's the done thing. Um, for someone with a mind which is curious and, and interested and, and needs to go further and needs to explore and, um, uh, you know, the, the, it, it, it doesn't make for a good combination sometimes um, because she's, she's continually sort of learning. So. So things like meditation, um, though she, you know, doesn't always kind of get it right and it doesn't always go the way she wants it to go. Um, I think the, the sort of the mental practices that Buddhism um, uh, sort of offers as a way of life, as a way of uh, ending suffering and craving, um, uh, I think are, are fantastic. You know, I, I started my meditation about 20 years ago purely for practical purposes, just um, because I was in a very sort of stressful news environment. Um, but it's something that I continue to do. And during this sort of the last, what is it, 46, 50 odd days that we've, we've been in curfew, yes. <laughs> um, it's been really interesting to, mm. to use the meditation to as a sort of a way of kind of going through that and developing more mindfulness. And I think the Buddha, the Buddha, one of the quotes that I love that he said was, you know, what we do in our present um, impacts our future. And certainly at a time like this, um, it's a good time for us to reflect on, um, on our lives holistically, um, what we do, what we can let go of, what we cannot do. Because, you know, when we come out of this, things will change. Work practices will change the way we communicate with lots of things will change and so it's a good opportunity I think for us to to practice mindfulness and to practice um, um, looking at the way we do things. Yeah very wise words and, and simpler ways of living perhaps. Absolutely absolutely. Well thank you Tanya that's been wonderful wonderful conversation so if I can just ask you finally when can we expect to see mum's word released here in Sri Lanka? Well, um, I know Barefoot have asked for uh, contact with the with the publishers, so I presume that you know something might be going on there. Um, everything sort of 
gone to ground because of COVID-19. So once we are sort of back up and running, um, hopefully, um, you know, that can, that can be progressed as well. Brilliant. I look forward to that. I had to read it, of course, in, a, in an electronic copy of the book, which yeah. I got from Amazon in the UK. So anybody wants to get a copy now, that's probably the best place and the best, best way of getting it. Yes, it is. It would, it's always lovely to have a physical copy of a book in your hand, isn't it? It's got, it's, it has a different um, feel about it, yeah. reading a physical book. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, really great that you're able to uh, talk to us this weekend, particularly. And um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're talking to your mum, send her a happy Mum's Day. <laughs> I certainly will. Um, I certainly will. And happy Mum's Day to, to, to all the mums out there, actually. Uh, exactly. Um, yes. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, hope to see you again and uh, for another interesting conversation about your work. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks very much, Jill. Thank you.